for those of you who grew up here in the El Paso Ciudad Juarez borderlands, this topic, the femicide, probably needs no introduction. Uh, even though I didn't grow up here in the El Paso Ciudad Juarez borderlands, I learned about the femicides since I was a high school student uh, back in Los Angeles. And actually, I remember almost every day back in, I want to say, more or less 2004, 2005, hearing the news reports of um, missing and disappeared women here in Ciudad Juarez. And then I didn't even know that I would end up here in El Paso um, talking about this and um, learning about how, how deep the story went. Everything from police brutality, um, everything from the role of the police and corrupt political officials, um, and of course, the drug lords. So uh, for those of you who maybe are not from here, um, this will be kind of an introduction to the nature of this violence. And for those of you who grew up here, it will maybe be a refresher. The term femicide, also known as feminicide, was coined by activists and feminists from our sister city, Ciudad Juarez, to, to describe the mass killings of women that occurred in the city roughly from 1993 and to the present. Femicidio continues to refer to the mass killings of women, not just in Juarez, but also other parts of the Mexican nation. In Ciudad Juarez, there were very few survivors of the femicides. In the following video, we hear testimony of a mother whose daughter was lucky to survive one of these assaults. As you can see in the video, both women had to conceal their identities in order to tell their stories. Like so many other witnesses, their lives could be in danger for simply telling the truth. Hay personas a las que les pagan para que callen, hay otras personas que les amenazan para que no hablen. Y, um, ¿Creéis que, que va a ocurrir? Gloria. No, sí, sí, todo el mundo sabe lo que pasa ahí. Lo que, toda la gente de Juárez sabe. Lo que pasa es que muchas también no hablan porque es lo que le digo se vive la gente con miedo mejor se calla mejor nos callamos porque si si denunciamos es la misma no hay ningún castigo para nadie al contrario agarran a gente muy inocente un chivo expiatorio a quien culpar de todo lo que le sucede a, a ciertas personas los castigan y, la, y los verdaderos culpables siempre están fuera siguiendo lo mismo, haciendo lo mismo. Es el cuento de nunca acabar. So who was killing these women? Reporters, law enforcement officials, and activists who were seeking answers to what happened to these women also became among the murdered and missing. Over a decade of investigative reporting revealed a dark reality. Many of these women were raped and others possibly killed after being raped just for sport. Some suspect that the killings were a rite of passage for men in order to prove themselves to be worthy of being narcotics or human traffickers. Contrary to rumors, the women who were kidnapped were not criminals, vagabonds, or prostitutes. These were mostly women who were simply taking the bus to go to work or to attend schools. In this new podcast that just aired last month, the investigative reporter Diana Washington offers this chilling tale about how these women, how these men preyed on poor women in downtown Ciudad Juarez who entered their personal information onto a school database. Downtown became, uh, and this is also information that FBI informants had given to the FBI, several of the young ladies that disappeared in downtown Juarez happened to have stopped into a computer school then called ECHO. The FBI again. This time it's the real FBI who had their own interest in solving these crimes. And their informant network in Juarez suggested that victims were being identified using a computer school called ECHO. In fact, ECHO was a national chain of schools. One opened in the early 90s in downtown Juarez. This was the time when the personal computer was on the rise. And you can imagine a young woman like Lily Alejandra working a grueling job on an assembly line, being tempted by the promise of transcending circumstances through computer literacy. After all, most of the victims' families had moved to Juarez in search of a better life, in search of opportunity, and computer schools could lead to a coveted white-collar job. 
What would happen is young ladies would be walking down the sidewalk and uh, someone would approach them with a clipboard. They call them the echo promoters, wanting to interest them in the training that the echo schools provided. The important thing about these uh, computer schools is that uh, the young ladies were putting their personal data into the questionnaires and their pictures were taken. So it became very easy for someone at another end, wherever this information was being forwarded to, to let this operate as a catalog, you know, a catalog of potential victims. Through the questionnaires they filled out at the computer schools, including their pictures, someone could sit down there and say, oh, yes, about this one or that one, you know. These schools were being used to look for and identify young women of certain profiles. Well, I mean, uh, women disappeared and then they were found murdered later, but they were selected. Approximately how many women linked to the computer school uh, were murdered? I can only vouch for six, but when I went back and I questioned the families of victims, uh, one of the questions I added to my interviews was, had they ever come into contact with the Neckel School? And they would say, oh yes, you know, oh yes. Lily Alejandra Andrade was one of them. Lily Alejandra disappeared on a Wednesday. Her first echo class was set to begin on the Saturday of that week. What Diana's reporting revealed went beyond a mere pattern. It suggested a process that almost certainly involved more than one person. And as she pushed to reveal who might be involved, she began to receive serious threats against her life. The phone is ringing. I pick it up. I don't recognize the telephone number that it's coming from, but it's coming, it appears, from Mexico. And I hear this this noise in the background, a newscast in English, and then all of a sudden, there's this electric saw sound coming in. We know that people get dismembered (laughs) over there. The other thing that made that call scary was hearing this child voice saying, Mommy, no. Mommy, no. Mommy, no. That was the same call? Yes. Yeah, it went on for like six minutes. Six long minutes. The call was bad enough. But it was the discovery of where it originated that was truly terrifying. One of my friends uh, at a federal law enforcement agency, I won't say which one because it was was done as a favor to me, they took my phone uh, to try and see if they could trace that call and they traced it back to Mexican military intelligence. The authorities have the responsibility for solving these crimes. They are the ones that need to name the killers and bring them to justice. They have not done this, and perhaps never intended to do it. Diana had a virtuous mission. She was trying to do what the police weren't doing. She was trying to call out this wrongdoing. And for someone to come in and prevent her from doing that, how dare you? Why would someone within Mexican military intelligence place threatening calls to a US journalist trying to find out who was killing the women in Juarez and why? Were they embarrassed by the international attention? Were they trying to protect the killer? Could they be involved themselves? Years of investigative reporting revealed that the drug lords who controlled the city were not the only masterminds of this violence. As mentioned in the previous podcast, those responsible for the femicides in Juarez also included government officials, the police, and even judges. The collusion of government, police, and organized crime has led activists to coin the term narco gobierno or narco government. This term became more popularized in the recent killings of the Mexica- in the Mexican state of Guerrero at Ayotzinapa. There, government officials ordered drug cartels and police officers to kidnap and assassinate 43 student protesters. 
These are the types of strings of corruption that has made it impossible for the families of the victims of femicide in Ciudad Juarez to seek justice. Any attempt to reveal the truth meant putting their lives at risk. It is well known that the perpetrators would send death threats to, to officials, activists, and their families if they asked too many questions. Those who brought too much attention to the killings were often beaten, tortured, and often mutilated before being killed. Journalists in El Paso, especially Diana Washington, were fortunate to carry out extensive studies into the nature of these killings. In this 2003 documentary, The City of the Lost Girls, she describes her findings to investigative journalist Sandra Jordan. I was told I could meet someone who had high-level sources inside Mexico and in the American FBI across the border. They've leaked her confidential documents concerning many of the killings. Diana Washington Valdez is a respected American journalist who's investigated the killings for five years. The Mexican federal authorities have conducted important investigations of their own already that reveal who the killers are. Five men from Juarez and one from Tijuana who get together and kill women in what can only be described as blood sport. We've discovered that these people that were revealed by these investigations are very important people and uh, some of the other people involved and uh, named uh, allegedly as killers are prominent men well, with important political connections, uh, considered untouchables. She told me about an FBI document passed to the Mexican police in March. An informant had given names and locations linked to some of the murders. She showed me a copy. The FBI agent said the Mexicans had failed to act on it. As you saw from the information, there are police being paid off to get rid of the bodies. We no longer have police that protect people. We have police that are accomplices of the killers. Diana took us to a downtown restaurant. According to the informant, the killer's henchmen sometimes lured young girls here. Afterwards, they were bundled out a back door into a neighboring hotel. Here, it seems the girls were raped and perhaps tortured. Diana's FBI sources are adamant the Mexican police haven't properly investigated these allegations. The informant claims that corrupt policemen sometimes help dispose of bodies. Diana took me to one notorious spot where eight girls were found. That's where yes. the forensic people marked them off. This is the place where the bodies were dumped. Five in here, three further over there. These crosses commemorate them. It's a very public place. Even though it looks like a bit of a wasteland, this is the busiest area, commercial area of Ciudad Juarez, and there are often people passing by here. It's amazing that whoever dumped them was able to get away with it. Some of this deciding where to dump the bodies uh, may be deliberate, maybe jokes among themselves, or messages, or just simply telling the community, well, so what? You know, we're going to do what we want to. The six men named as the killers have ties to drug trafficking. I met Patricia Garavay, an ex-trafficker who said to understand the killings, I had to understand the Juarez drug cartels. Here in Ciudad Juarez, there is no difference between cartel and the police. Our law enforcement, it's the same thing. So there are some people in Ciudad Juarez who are above the law. No matter what they do, they're no not going to be ever, arrested. Never, ever, ever. The, the corruption is so high that they're being paid up from... High up. How high are we? Okay. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Most of the businesses are built by cartel money. This is the biggest money laundering place you can ever find. How are the cartels involved in killing the women? I seem to feel that uh, they do it for sport. They have nothing else to do. I mean, they need excitement in their life, and that's how they get it. I mean, up to a certain point, 
they have so much money they don't know what to do. They start looking for new ways of amusement. And I think they found it. In the past, officials arrested many innocent people for supposedly being the masterminds behind all these murders. This was not the case, however, since the killings went on even after the arrest of supposed serial murderers. One such case involved the arrest of a woman who went by the alias Cynthia Kiko. The police said that the American owner of a craft shop, Cynthia Kiko, had confessed to murdering Viviana. I went to meet two of her friends who had signed statements saying they'd seen her carry out the killing. The police said they wanted her to answer a few questions. They were in hiding, but with their lawyers and bodyguards they agreed to meet me. Manuel Lopez and Erica Perez said the police had forced them to sign statements. Manuel had sketched the conditions under which he was held, gagged and shackled to a bed in handcuffs. He said they tortured him by putting electrodes on his testicles, on his back, by electrocuting him, by covering his face with plastic bags and to asphyxiate him, by covering his face with a towel also to suffocate him. And this went on until eventually he gave in and he said whatever they wanted him to say. Manuel had drawn the police station where he was held. I decided to take a look. Por aquí. For 10 years, the Mexican courts have jailed people in connection with the serial killings. But Mexican and international human rights groups like Amnesty say justice hasn't been done. Hola! There's a light on here. The air conditioning is on. There should be somebody here, but if they are, they're ignoring us. Time and again, there's evidence the police have tortured suspects and witnesses Hola. and planted evidence. Hola, se encuentra alguien? Meanwhile, the real killers have remained free. Hola, se encuentra alguien a casa? and the murders have continued. No. If there's someone there, they're not coming out. Later that day, the woman accused of killing Viviana, Cynthia Kiko, called me from a prison telephone. You say you're innocent, right? Yes, of course. And can you tell me why you confessed? They were in charge of us, and my husband was in another room. I could hear him screaming. Um, they were giving me electric shocks. Um, then I was telling her face to face. I said, listen, I, we don't have anything to do with this. I'm telling the truth. And, and then they said, if you don't, if you don't go along with the story and you get another treatment, there was no way I could get out of it and say the truth. They, they wouldn't let me. And then on Sunday, too, they took me into a room. There was my husband naked sitting on a crate with four judiciales around, surrounding him with these um, electric prodder things, ap um, apparatuses, and they were burning him with this electricity and they, they threatened to kill me. When you cross the bridge and walk around downtown Juarez to this day, you can still see dozens if not hundreds of posters of missing women. The disappearances and murders of women in the city continue to this day, although some will say perhaps not to the great scale that they once did just a little under a decade ago. Just this year in January, a massive protest took place at the International Bridge to protest the killing of Isabel Cabanillas. She was an activist and artist who was part of the collective known as Hija de, Hijas de su Maquilera Madre, which you will be learning about in the assigned video. So what was the legacy of highlighting the realities of femicide in Juarez? For starters, the unfortunate events in our sister city have brought international attention to femicides, not just in Ciudad Juarez, but also in other parts of Mexico. In various parts of the Mexican nation, 
media outlets have begun covering the murders of women who were killed, dismembered, and disappeared, which highlight how violence against women was not just restricted to the Mexican North. Recently, the abduction, kidnapping, and death of the seven-year-old Fatima Quintana in Mexico City sparked outrage as security cameras showed she was kidnapped on her way home from school. According to the suspect who committed the kidnapping, Gladys Giovanna, she kidnapped Fatima because her husband, Mario Alberto, said he wanted a younger girlfriend. As bizarre and sick as this case was, it highlighted the grim realities that children were not spared as casualties of femicide. What is the legacy of femicides in the United States and the world? Knowledge about these events encourage activists and feminists at home to put political pressure on Mexican officials with offices such as consulates in the U.S. and in other parts of the globe. Additionally, the femicides have also called attention to the murders and violence against women in our own backyard. Activists in the LGBTQ community point out that trans women have been killed at an alarming rate over the past two decades, if not even longer. Native American women also have called attention to the fact that many of their women have been disappeared and called attention to inaction from both the U.S. and Canada in helping to solve these crimes and murders. As you self-reflect on this lesson, consider the following. What can we learn about femicide in Mexico and here in the United States? What sorts of beliefs and attitudes about the ways that our society treats women needs to change in order for us to create a safer world? How can we prevent boys and men from developing misogynistic attitudes and beliefs about women, whether they are, they are trans or cis women, that view them as disposable objects? How can we challenge the culture of toxic masculinity that perpetuates violence against women in our homes and in our own communities.